am so honored to have these two guests here. I had invited Christopher to speak here when he was running for Congress mm -hmm. as a communist, and mm -hmm. I think maybe the only communist in, in the country. In the country, openly on the ballot. <laughs> <laughs> so I just thought that was extraordinary. So I invited him to come and speak, and um, so I'm really glad to have you back. But. Christopher has a very, <coughs> a very wide range of things he's done, and I can't even. He's been a he's he served in the army mm -hmm. for uh, for a number of years. Yep. You, he has uh, fought in Syria and with the Kurds. In, in the Kurds, mm -hmm. he has. Um, you are you are the secretary of. International Secretary. Uh, International Secretary of For, the Communist Party. I am, yep. So um, <laughs> he can tell more, but he lives in Berkshire, Vermont, and mm -hmm. is a father of two children, and a farmer, and a scholar of PhD student now, yeah? Marxist <laughs> philosophy and <That's> right. <laughs> theology or something. <laughs> and Martha Hennessy is a, also a Vermont resident and was a member of the Kings Bay Plowshare 7 and served time 10 months mm -hmm. for um, destruction of government property and uh, depredation of government property, destruction of naval property, conspiracy and trespass. Yes. So a very, very, you know, serious criminal here. <laughs> and, um, she's also a member of the uh, Catholic Worker, and her grandmother founded it, and um, she was an occupational therapist and is also a grandmother and lives in Wethersfield, Vermont. And I asked them to just speak a little more about themselves, but then to sort of zero in on what informs their political practice. If they can just speak to that, that would be wonderful. And then sure. if people have questions towards the end, that would be nice to just have a discussion also. Mm -hmm. Thank you for coming. And thank, thank you. For coming. Thank you so much. Thank you. Absolutely. Ladies before gentlemen. <laughs> <laughs> So I, I continue to be amazed at the bread and puppet community. Um, you know, who would get an atheist, communist, and a Catholic together? <laughs> uh, there's got to be some jokes for that. <laughs> but I first heard about bread and puppet in the 1960s when I was a little kid. Um, Dorothy handed me this little booklet that was produced, and it was against war. And then in the 1990s, I brought my kids up here. Um, and I very clearly remember a sideshow regarding the rape camps in Bosnia, um, the, bomb, the NATO bombing of, of that part of the world at that time. And I started my criminal career in maybe 1979. Uh, I was arrested for protesting the Seabrook nuclear power plant in uh, Manchester, New Hampshire, or Seabrook. They had their headquarters in Manchester. And last summer, I spent two months in a halfway house in Manchester, New Hampshire, uh, 40 years later, or something to that extent. And it really felt like a full circle in terms of my activism. And I had a hiatus from 1979 until um, in 2007, um, we were in Washington, D.C., protesting the uh, detention of uh, Muslim prisoners in Guantanamo, where they were being tortured. The same story, same story, different place, different faces. And that was a real eye-opener for me, you know, to, to step back into the arena of, of resistance. And then we got engaged with uh, the drone situation, the, the use of unmanned aerial vehicles for assassination. And we protested at Hancock Air Base uh, at the gates there. 
where the MQ Reaper drones were uh, being maintained and people were being trained to, to use them there. And we did that for a few years, and I, little did I fully understand that I was pretty much being led into a plowshares action. And it's not as if my discerning process was clear. Um, I had heard about the plowshares movement. It started in 1980, the, the year Dorothy died. Uh, the Berrigan brothers uh, initiated it. And I had friends over the decades who had participated in different actions. And so ours was around the hundredth such action. There also have been um, plowshares actions in Europe, uh, the US. And essentially, it's a question of uh, targeting uh, nuclear installations or uh, manufacturing sites of the nuclear weapons. And of course, our goal is to put the nuclear weapons on trial in US federal court. And that has certainly been stymied for 40 plus years in terms of what the judge allows, um, what the prose prosecution, how the prosecution frames the, the event and all of that. So we did this action. We took this action on April 4th, uh, 2018, the 50th anniversary of the state killing of Martin Luther King Jr. And we, we had a little bit of a difficulty with um, white appropriation. Uh, that was definitely a consideration that we had to look at. We were all white. We were all Catholic. Um, we certainly did not suffer in the prison system the way people of co color, you know, routinely do. And we walked onto this naval base that um, Jimmy Carter had handed over to the Navy. He had been in the Navy himself in 1979, I believe. It's 70,000 acre, a huge, huge plot of indigenous land in a very uh, special location uh, near the coast. And. Uh, it's the Trident nuclear weapon system that we were addressing. And the United States has a West Coast base that has eight Trident subs and the East Coast, <coughs> Kings Bay. And the Trident uh, system is designed to strike anywhere on the planet within 15 minutes. And each sub has enough firepower to kill the world more than once. So we chose that site just because of the uh, geopolitical situation um, where the nuclear weapons have kind of remained hidden, you know, for my children's generation. In my generation, we did do duck and cover. So we really felt it was important to address that particular leg of the nuclear triad um, concerning what was going on globally. And we poured blood. We symbolically hammered on the mock-up weapons that they had on display for the public. The Boy Scout groups would come and learn about our nuclear arsenal. And for my part, personally, I went to the administrative building and poured blood on the threshold and posted an indictment on the door, uh, indicting the president, the captain of the base, uh, all the way down for the war crimes, crimes against humanity, the violation of Geneva Convention, Nuremberg principles, et cetera, et cetera. And it took a long time for us to um, go through the whole process of um, pre-sentencing, sentencing, sentencing um, uh, trial, and sentencing. And so I served uh, five months in the Danbury uh, prison, and of course, we do look, as, as Catholic workers, we look at the works of mercy. I also work at the uh, Mary House in New York, where Dorothy died, where we feed uh, the women and have clothing and showers and phone access. But part of the works of mercy, besides feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, is um, visiting the prisoner. And going to prison is th probably the best way to visit prisoners. Mm -hmm. And that was a Universe, university education, really, um, finding out who's there and why. And with my training as an occupational therapist, you know, it was inevitable that I was witnessing, you know, people who had not had their needs met, educationally, socially, psychologically, 
And so it's, you know, we, it's, it's a scapegoat system that where we put the least among us. Um, we punish them to make ourselves feel better and, and, and to avoid the fact that we have failed. We have failed a, a whole underclass. So I could just go on forever and ever. Um, I think one of the questions Tamar um, asked was, how do you stay informed? How do you listen to the news? And yeah, that's a tough one. You know, when I'm in New York, I look at the New York Times, and it's an exercise in reading between the lines and um, extrapolating and reversing things and to try and even begin to understand. So we're, we're following, we've been vigiling, um, we fasted and vigiled at the UN regarding Yemen, the, the starvation, the wholesale starvation of an entire nation. And so I read the New York Times, I listen to Amy Goodman on Democracy Now. Um, I read our, our own paper that started in 1933, The Catholic Worker. And we do our best to stay informed. Um, we understand that the mainstream media lies to us daily. Um, the propaganda is very intense. And we have to train ourselves to um, look at these events. You know, this nuclear power plant in Ukraine, Russia's using it as a, as a shield. Um, we have to take all of these stories with a grain of salt and really try to analyze what truly is happening. And it's not easy. It's not easy. I have traveled um, as a means of visiting the enemy and informing myself as to what's going on in the world. I've traveled to Afghanistan, Iran. I was at Gaza. I tried to get into Gaza Strip on two occasions and was not successful. Um, the best way to um, really inform yourself is to get out of this country, um, to really find out. I, I had some trips to South Korea, where the US military pretty much runs the show there. Uh, nuclear weapons are. Um, we're moved out of Korea, but uh, they're all over the South China Sea. So that's all I have to say for now. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, it's a real pleasure and honor to, to be here um, and to be with my dear friend and comrade, Martha. Mm -hmm. We've known each other for, for many years now. Um, I think uh, first I'd, I'd like to begin by asking a question. Mm. Are there any colonies in Africa still? Anybody can tell me? Anybody know? You say yes? Can you tell me where? Anybody know? Morocco. Morocco is the colonizer. <laughs> Who are they colonizing? Western Sahara. Western Sahara is the last colony in Africa, the last struggle of the movement for decolonization. Mm -hmm. And I had the extreme honor and pleasure of being uh, in the refugee camps in Algeria, where the Polisario Front, uh, the recognized leadership of Western Sahara, uh, has their headquarters. And I got to sit this close to the president of the Sahrawi Arab Democratic Republic. And I was shocked when I, was, uh, when I realized that my comrade and I were the only two Americans on the trip and that there is a complete media blackout about mm -hmm. the Sahrawi people, about the struggle in Western Sahara. Mm -hmm. Most of you wouldn't know that Western Sahara and Morocco are again engaged in armed conflict, that there is a war again in the region. Mm -hmm. And most people would not know it's been going on for two years now. Most people wouldn't know that the, one of the longest walls in the world is built in the Sahel, in the desert, four walls spanning over a thousand kilometers. Mm. Nobody knows. Nobody knows. Who helped to build that wall? Mm, if I look over there, maybe I make a connection. Who else has a big wall separating people? Israel. Mm -hmm. Israelis mm -hmm. helped to build the, the wall. Because Morocco, as we understand it, is the tip of the spear of US and NATO imperialism mm -hmm. and their allies in the region. And part of this plan that uh, former President Trump uh, cooked up was to get these Arab nations to normalize relations with Israel. So 
part of why I say this is that most people, and I'm a teacher, so I know my students, not a clue mm-hmm. where Western Sahara is, and not to mention many of the maps in our classrooms show that whole region as Morocco, mm. de facto, because most of it is controlled now by the Moroccan forces. Mm. Only a small strip of land is controlled by the SADR forces. Um, and most people have no clue. Maybe you hear it on Democracy Now! Amy Goodman does a little presentation about it. But mainstream media, you won't hear much. Maybe if you're watching Al Jazeera or something like that. So in thinking about the struggles that go on around the world and trying to understand, okay, how do I discern what I'm seeing? And how do I find out more? Mm. Uh, I have an adage I even tell my students. I said, more often than not, if you're on the side of the CIA, you're on the wrong side. (laughs) More often than not. Um, And what do I mean? I mean to say that uh, there are, of course, powerful forces and powerful interests that seek to maintain their hegemony uh, over oppressed peoples. Why? Because since the majority of the world is, uh, is oppressed peoples with a lot of resources, well, those resources are the things that make us rich and give us the quality of life. Uh, whereas other people live in camps with uh, no potable water, uh, no electricity, uh, no access to proper health care, proper education. And so when thinking about this, you know, I've, both of us have traveled to Palestine and thinking about this today, this is the story everywhere in so many parts of the world. Uh, it's a story in here, in this country as well. Mm. It's the story of people who have been marginalized to an extent where they are erased from our consciousness. We live in a sort of uh, artificial bubble where we, we are conveniently uh, distracted from the truth and the reality that exists here. Not only of the people who are suffering, who are dying, the genocides being committed, you know, the violations of sovereignty and self-determination, but also the destruction and the rape of our planet, the complete annihilation of species for our pleasure, for our wealth, and for our domination. Because some people believe it was given from above. So how do we read? How do we study? How can we discern what's going on? And uh, for me, it's, it's a challenge. It's always a challenge. It's always a very difficult thing to do. And I think as someone who uh, remembers where I was, I was actually late at night in February when we got the news of the beginning of uh, the, the, the uh, special military operation that's going on, the war in Ukraine. Um, of course, Martha and I knew about this for a long time because the war hadn't started in February. The war had been ongoing since 2014. So when I walked into the class, you know, uh, just a day, few two days later, and to the students, and they always say, oh, Mr. Halali, oh, oh, because you study this region and you're, you know, Soviet history and all this stuff. What's going on? And I said, where have you been? <laughs> What's going on? Where, where have you been? You know, and we were talking on the way up here, recollecting, you know, the fact that, you know, even in two th- as, as uh, late as 2000, we were at a conference in New York where we had activists from Russia and Ukraine there talking about the killing of the trade unionists in 2014, the killing of 15,000 uh, residents, civilians in Donetsk and Lugansk by the Ukrainian forces. Um, and we were doing solidarity all that time. I was the only person uh, in the campaign uh, in Vermont uh, running for Congress um, in the 2020 uh, that spoke about Donetsk and Lugansk. So when the, when the conflict began, VPR reached out and said, wow, even in your campaign poster, you had Ukraine with a bomb on it. And said, oh, maybe you can come speak to us. And before I went on, the interview was canceled. So <laughs> that's just a uh, little bit of uh, uh, evidence there that uh, the narratives uh, that uh, you know, we have and that we know and that the knowledge that we share uh, is dangerous in and of itself because it can destroy convenient narratives by the state to... Uh, 
find the money that they couldn't find during the pandemic when they were, you know, oh, we have no money, financial issues. Oh, I'm sorry, we can't give any more checks for the working class who are suffering because of lockdowns and this. Oh, billions? How many billions do you need? Write the check. Raytheon, Boeing, send the missiles. Of course, they always find the money for that. The money's there, the weapons are there, anything you want. In fact, they have to restrain themselves because they know that if they give too much, they might escalate this. Although some people, I'm sure, want to escalate it, like John Bolton and those types. I think that today we are living in a, in a real moment of transformation. Martha and I don't know if it's necessarily good or bad <laughs> when that's out. Um, but I think what we are experiencing now is a seismic shift uh, in terms of uh, the global order, the international order. Um, you know, we can remember that in the, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, you know, uh, the theorists were thinking, like Francis Fukuyama, that this was the end of history, that uh, that's it, liberalism has uh, reigned supreme, mm. and that slowly, slowly, one by one, all the nations will move towards uh, mm. some form of uh, a liberal uh, free market system. Has that turned out to be true? Nope, quite the contrary. <laughs> I think quite the contrary. And I think that what we are experiencing now is um, the decline of a unipolar system of US hegemony with, uh, as Noam Chomsky always says, mm -hmm. with its military wing as NATO. Uh, NATO being a force that was, quote unquote, protection for, for Europe from Soviet aggression. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, NATO is in Africa. N Colombia is an international partner of NATO in Asia. Mm -hmm. Why is NATO everywhere? It's a convenient large military force, the largest military alliance. And it has that power. So it's, it's, it's a little bit shocking to me now when we see leftists or people who are socially conscious who were, I remember, protesting the Iraq war and calling Bush and Cheney war criminals, all of a sudden cozying up to the same neoconservative uh, ghouls that are promoted on MSNBC now and on the mainstream uh, networks and saying that absolutely we support NATO, absolutely we support uh, the troops and this and that. Wait a minute, <laughs> what happened? How did this transformation somehow occur? where it's such a vibrant peace movement, the largest mm. peace protests in history, uh, the anti-war movement against the Iraq war, has led us to this point where people that we were once you know, close to <clears throat> have gone in a different direction. Um, and it is quite uh, disconcerting, no doubt. And I think that when you're looking at the global situation, when you're looking at uh, the international uh, you know, rules-based order, quote-unquote, that they say, you see it's barbarism uh, mm -hmm. on the side of, uh, especially on our side, we have to take responsibility for the crimes of uh, our country and the crimes of its allies. I think many of the things that we are witnessing is the birth of a multipolar order, and the U.S. does not want that, uh, and will do everything in its power to, to stop that, to stymie that. Why? Because China is standing up, Russia is standing up, uh, Iran, Venezuela, Cuba, Nicaragua, South Africa. These countries no longer tolerate you know, being lectured to <clears throat> by especially the five eyes, United States, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, United Kingdom, uh, but then also the other former colonial powers like Belgium, France, and uh, you know, sort of Western Europe. I think if you're looking at it in that sense, uh, you realize that we are actually entering into a very dangerous time because there's no money to help the homeless in San Francisco, but Nancy Pelosi can get on a plane and go to Taiwan and cause a whole, a whole international uh, crisis. Mm -hmm. uh, to do what? Ultimately, to serve powerful interests because uh, Taiwan is more than capable of dealing with its brothers and sisters in China, but the United States has to get its nose involved uh, to ensure that uh, China recognizes that the, the, the dual, the double speak, you know, because you heard, for example, one China policy. What does one China policy mean? Anybody can tell me? What is one China policy when the Biden administration said, oh, yes, absolutely, we agree with the one China policy? Any idea? 
Chinese colonialism. They're taking over. They're taking over who? Taiwan. That the, so that you you think that the Chinese are colonizing Taiwan? I'm saying that. Oh, that's what they're saying. Yeah. Well, so actually, the One China policy was formulated by by the, the Chinese, saying that Chiang Kai-shek, who lost the Civil War, went to Taiwan and made a renegade province. But that province still belongs to China territorially. It's sovereign Chinese territory. The Americans say, yes, we acknowledge that. However, we don't acknowledge it in, in practice. Because when they go to Taiwan, they don't ask the Chinese foreign ministry for permission. They don't get the visas from Beijing. They just go to Taiwan and ask uh, you know, the, the Taiwanese government to do what, uh, to do what they must. So ultimately, these kind of actions only show that, uh, especially here, uh, the dangerous escalations that are happening. That's not to say that other countries out there are blameless. I'm not saying that. I'm simply saying that when you have concentrated wealth and power and a monopoly of violence, you have tremendous, tremendous risks and tremendous um, uh, violence enacted upon other people. We don't necessarily see it, although it is all over. And you only have to open the eyes to see, you know, the connections. And we have, uh, we have you know, dear comrades and friends who have made the, the connections for the past decades. For example, opium. Has Vermont suffered from the opioid epidemic? For sure. Many of my neighbors, many of my students' parents, some have lost family members. And then you recognize... Who is the main exporter of opium? Anyone know? Afghanistan. Afghanistan. Who was guarding opium fields? We were. U.S. troops. So we were paying tax dollars to our boys and girls in uniform to go to Afghanistan to secure the fields, but somehow 97% of the opium comes from Afghanistan. We've got to ask some questions. Somebody's got to ask some questions here. And then the pharmaceutical companies are getting rich. And again, we have to use our tax dollars uh, and, and help to uh, curtail the absolute violence and chaos that it's ravaging upon families, our local communities, and upon our, our, our country. You have to ask, who's getting rich here? Who's doing this? For what purpose? The same way in Vietnam. The same way in a lot of South Asia, CIA was funding a lot of their stuff from, from drugs. It's a fact. Not a conspiracy theory, proven. So here, you know, I will, I will uh, wrap it up here in thinking about this, but I think that, uh, you know, uh, Tamar was very sweet in reaching out to us and saying, people have questions today. People are concerned. People are wondering. And I know this because my students ask me the same questions. Not always with an open mind. Some of my students went home and said, Mr. Halali thinks that JFK was killed by the CIA. And then the parents start calling and saying, uh-oh, what's going on? Who's this wacko? Then, of course, I have to, uh, you know, of course, me, I don't just uh, talk. I have the sources. So I bring to them, you see this, printed by Congress. What is it? Oh, the House Select Committee on Assassinations. What does it say here? John F. Kennedy was likely killed by a conspiracy. Doesn't say who. Doesn't say how. But it says it was a conspiracy. It wasn't only Oswald, right? So... In doing these things, what I hope, uh, and that's part of my activism, what informs my activism, is uh, opening people's minds to truths that are inconvenient and that are pushed aside. Uh, the narrative, of course, for Palestine is put back on me that I'm anti-Semitic, and I have been smeared that way in the media. Uh, many of people that we know have been smeared as anti-Semites. Uh, as uh, Jew haters, uh, the people that are Jewish that we love and that we support in, in Jewish Voice for Peace are smeared as self-hating Jews, some of them descendants of Holocaust survivors. So I just want to say how powerful the forces are against the, some of the messages that we are trying to get across and how it is my hope that we continue to open people's eyes to see and to hold this country more than anyone else because we live here. We pay taxes here. We are culpable at the end of the day. Our tax dollars, part of it, goes to that bomb that gets lobbed to some poor village and kills a whole wedding party in uh, Yemen or in Afghanistan where the people are ready to celebrate the bride and the groom. And next thing you know, 50, 60 dead. And America, the, the Pentagon says, ooh, I'm sorry, we made a mistake, uh, collateral damage. So 
that's, uh, that's really the hope uh, and uh, the push, especially I think that drives uh, Martha and myself, uh, is, is really to help to open people. And if that requires us putting our bodies on the line, uh, that's what we'll do. Uh, because we have no choice at this point. We're on the precipice, not only of ecological catastrophe, but of nuclear disaster at this point. So I'd love to open it up uh, if you'd like. Anything. Traveled to Russia in 2016, and I heard, we went. We were in Crimea, and part of the purpose of our trip was to hear about this so-called Russian takeover of Crimea. And we heard stories. We heard stories about um, some of the Crimeans bust themselves to Maidan Square and were there to try and be in solidarity with the people who were complaining about the corruption and the conditions that they wanted changed. And they were beaten and barely escaped with their lives. And then we also heard that like 80 to 90 percent of the people of Crimea voted and voted to stay with Russia because they saw the fascist elements that were taking over Ukraine, which the U.S. had been supporting since 2014. I mean, I'm not a historian. I don't know a whole lot, but I do know what I was hearing from people there, and I trusted that that's how they felt and that's what they had experienced. And uh, it's, a, it's an absolute provocation, what's occurring there now. The United States is happy to see the Ukrainians destroyed. You know, that's, 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 a, that's a moral, uh, legal crime. And, and what we've done to Vietnam, what we did to Korea, what we've done to Vietnam, what we did to Iraq, what we did to Afghanistan, you know, how long will we be getting away with this? I've had several trips to Kabul as well, and we had friends that we were desperately trying to get out a year ago, still working on getting people out of there. And so the United States can carry on this war for 20 years and then turn its back and start another war? Is the American public that Brain dead? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I would. I would say uh, first and foremost. Um, I always tell my students, uh, history is the muse. We go to her. We go to her, and we discover what's going on. So, if we go back and we recognize that at in the in the twilight of the Soviet Union, NATO was a critical issue. Don't listen to the talking heads who are saying, "Oh, NATO now becomes a critical issue for Putin." He's been saying it since 2000. Nobody's been listening. And I have all the videos to prove it. And I put it to my students and they said, he said that in when? 2007, 2008, 2009, in Munich, with Bush, with Clinton? We, yeah. So we go back and we say, Gorbachev told Reagan and Thatcher, mm -hmm. look, I'm willing to, we're gonna, that's it. Soviet Union is, is, is in its twilight. I will give up control of the, many of the Eastern European states. Um, in exchange for uh, that NATO not move one inch. And some of the US administration, speaking with the double speak again, said absolutely, but behind the scenes, this is our opportunity, right? If NATO was an alliance for defense against Soviet aggression, if the Soviet Union disappears, who's the enemy? Especially when Yeltsin, a little bit on the bottle, 
was uh, very much in favor of whatever the US wanted to do, except for NATO expansion. All right? Most people don't even know that the Communist Party of the Russian Federation under Yenedi Zuganov won the elections under Yeltsin, but another coup to ensure the communists didn't come back to power because another theme that you'll hear conveniently, but of course, Martha's been to Russia, my brother, my brother finally went and I told him, please ask people on the streets what they thought of it if they lived through it. And he said he was shocked. He was shocked by the results of what happened. Just like I was surprised when I went to China and lived there for two years and talked to villagers everywhere and realized, boy, oh boy, my history books really did, did change the narrative a bit. What does that mean? It means ultimately that if a country keeps saying for 30 years, please don't move forward, please don't move forward, please stop coming, we have our own territory, we have to protect it, and they keep moving, ultimately you have to ask, what are you doing? Right? Let's go back to history. 1960s, early 1960s. What happened in this hemisphere that was brought us to the precipice? Cuba. Cuban Missile Crisis. In that case, it was reversed. Fidel Castro called up Khrushchev, put some missiles in here. I want to defend the revolution. They did. They put tactical, medium range ballistic missiles there, nuclear capable. There were nuclear <coughs> weapons on the island. The Kennedy administration, the people behind Kennedy, like Curtis LeMay, were ready to bring the whole, the whole temple down. They were ready to go bomb the hell out of Cuba and bring about World War III. Thankfully, both Khrushchev and Kennedy had seen war. That's a beautiful exchange in the letters mm -hmm. when Khrushchev said, you and I have seen villages annihilated, complete devastation. Let's not bring it to that now. Cooler heads prevailed, right? Was the U.S. happy about nuclear, tactical nuclear weapons 90 miles off the coast? No. The U.S. in 2010 wasn't, 2019 wasn't even happy when I was in Venezuela of two nuclear-capable Russian bombers landing in Caracas. Why? Monroe Doctrine. This hemisphere is our hemisphere. Nobody interferes. But wait a minute. Ukraine is historically linked to Russia. The Kievan Rus, Orthodox Christianity, all that stuff. Now you want to go there? So wait, you get the Monroe Doctrine for the whole hemisphere and a country can't even defend its borders? See, that's the problem. The problem is that here we think absolutely spreading democracy, freedom, human rights, everywhere we go. Wait a minute, every other big country out there wants to defend their own sphere of influence. Of course, it's just power politics. It's the way realism works. That's why you have people like John Mershimer at the University of Chicago, not a leftist by any stretch of the imagination, wrote a whole piece in Foreign Affairs saying the U.S. is to blame for the Ukraine crisis. Why? The U.S. is the one going there and pushing NATO. The U.S. tomorrow could tell its NATO allies, you know what? We're done. We move far enough. But no, it's got to go. Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia, Poland, Hungary, Bulgaria, Romania, and slowly creeping in. Let me ask you a question. If you're a Russian sitting in the Kremlin, you say, they came in the crusading times, the Poles and Lithuanians, they came with Napoleon, they came World War I and World War II. And how many lives did they give? How many people died in the Great Patriotic War in World War II? 25, 26 million Soviet citizens. It's not easy to give that up. So when you look at the conflict and you say, okay, both of us are against war. But you have to ask, who started this war? Who started the chaos? Who wanted regime change in Ukraine to begin with? It's there in the audio tapes, Victoria Nuland saying it live. That's our guy, you know? They didn't want a pro, necessarily a pro-Russian president there. So how do I, for example, perceive it? If I'm supporting the Russian camp or the US camp, or how do I get involved as an activist? I get involved as an activist telling the truth. And I posted in the Vermont Digger, I got so much hate mail, <laughs> my wife said, we gotta leave, we gotta go, you know? I was the only one in my high school not to wear the Ukrainian flag ribbon. Why? Why would I wear the flag of Ukraine? Why would I wear the flag of Ukraine? When Ukraine's army consists of neo-Nazis that my family fought against in Greece, in the, Greek, in the Greek war against Nazism and the Civil War, where the Nazis who had, who had been, where the Nazis had lost, but had built a fascist coalition who were then supported by the US and the British and destroyed the communists in Greece and executed some of my family members. Why would I support the Azov Battalion or right sector, all these people? It's there in plain, plain sight. 
all of the Nazi insignia. In fact, if you go back, 2015, 2016, 17, 18, 19, 20, the media here was saying, uh-oh, there's a white supremacist uh, situation in Ukraine, there's a lot of neo-fascism in Ukraine, there's a lot of neo-Nazism. All of a sudden today, the Azov Battalion are heroes. Wait a minute, Vice just did a documentary three years ago about the, the training, and the kids all have white power, and uh, uh, what is it, uh, 88 tattoos and all this stuff, all this, and the, the Totenkampf, the skull of the SS. Well, wait a minute. Maybe the people in eastern Ukraine who have some memory of May 9th and have some memory of the Great Patriotic War, maybe they don't want to be involved with that. Maybe they're saying, well, wait a minute. Ukraine just banned the Communist Party in 2014. Ukraine banned the Communist Party. Ooh, banned the Communist Party for what? They're small. They don't do much. But they are there as a, as a, you know, as a force in parliament. They banned them. They start to ban other socialist parties. They kill trade unionists. They imprison leftist activists. Then you start to asking questions. What's going on here? But am I going to flag? Am I going to fly the Ukrainian flag? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Why? It could have been easy enough for everybody to say we declare neutrality. We won't be in any power block. The non-aligned movement did it. How did everybody else do it? Yugoslavia did it. All these other countries said, you know what? Neither east nor west. We're pursuing our own thing. That's Bandung. That's the majority of the world pursued that line during the Cold War. Ukraine could have done it, but there are powerful forces behind the scene who are willing to put Ukraine as a sacrificial lamb to gain their interests. But before this Ukraine crisis, many people don't even remember Georgia. Do you remember the war in Georgia? Mm -hmm. Yeah? In the, in, the, in the late 2000s? Yeah. Yeah, why? Because, uh, what was it? Uh, was it Shakasvili or whoever there was a president over there? He said, yeah, we're going to join Ukraine, we're going to join NATO. That's it. We are joining, wait a minute, Georgia's right on the border. And it borders a particularly hot spot for Russia. You have nearby Chechnya, Dagestan, all these places. There was another war over the same issue. Nobody learns their lesson. That's the problem. Nobody learns their lesson. So now I am supposed to lament the fact that everybody saw this coming, that we've been talking about it for years, and now everybody's like, oh, that's it, send money to the Ukrainian army. To the Ukrainian army? I'm not sending money to people who wear this uh, swastikas and SS stuff and go there talking about Slava Ukraini, the, the motto of the, the UPA, that, you know, the guy that is, that is uh, the hero of modern Ukraine is Stepan Bandera. Who is Stepan Bandera? Bandera was the leader of the Ukrainian forces that were collaborators with the Nazis and that helped to perpetrate the Holocaust. Why am I going to have, why am I going to support people that support him? In fact, there was a Jewish commentator from Ukraine who said Zelensky must be the first Jewish president in a modern history to support openly fascist elements within his government who, who their ancestors perpetrated the massacre and the killing of his people. Maybe it's because Zelensky put Ukraine above his Jewish identity. I don't know. But ultimately, a lot of questions to be asked here. A lot of questions. What are we doing all the way over there? And what does NATO have anything to do? In fact, many people don't even know Russia asked to join NATO. Did you know that? Before Ukraine. Before Ukraine. Russia asked to join NATO. They said, you know what? We agree. We need a common European security situation. We'll join too. Guess what? Uh-uh-uh. Why? Yes. It's a very lucrative business, this uh, war machine. Why are we going to have Russia, if they're the boogeyman, why are we going to have them join? Doesn't do any good for Boeing and Raytheon, Lockheed Martin, Northrop Grumman, for Remington, Smith & Wesson, Colt. Doesn't do very well. Their shareholders are not too pleased. So if I'm thinking about this, and I wrote it in Vermont Digger, you have to look at the conflict not at February 2022, the long history. And when you understand the long history, you realize, oh boy, do we have some culpability in this, and do we have some responsibility for what's going on? And that's why I'm not, I'm not flag-waving. Russia is right now active in this military operation. Civilians have died. I am against it, and I oppose it, of course. What normal person wouldn't? But ultimately, there are, such, there are tremendous forces here at play that are very, very dangerous. Very dangerous. And it could have been as simple as Ukraine will be neutral. But the US and its allies in NATO could not bring themselves to declare Ukraine neutral. Why? 
ultimately, when you explore that question, you realize deeper, darker aspects of how this country maintains its hegemony and what it ultimately is geared towards. That's the sad part. That's the sad part, because Russia was open to Ukraine being neutral. But it was not open to Ukraine being a member of NATO, where tactical nuclear weapons can be placed on US uh, weapon systems, like the F-35, which is based in Burlington, which I told my students is now on the hit list of Russia and China. Because why? Because as Martha well knows, the nuclear triad is the nuclear readiness force of the United States military. It includes rocket systems like the ICBMs and, uh, and uh, the medium range ballistic missiles. It includes submarines. And now it includes the F-35 as a strategic, nuclear capable, short range fighter. Oh, there it is. What are they doing here? I always tell my students we're gonna fight the Great Maple Wars now with Quebec, with the F-35. Ultimately, when you research these things, you realize, boy, oh boy, we got some fucked up priorities. I pardon my, my, my French here, but that's the ultimate thing. It's really devastating for me. It's very devastating to see this because innocent people die. And that's a problem. I've seen war firsthand. I was in Syria in 2017 with my Kurdish brothers and sisters. Nobody wants it. It's the most horrific thing. And to have it happen knowingly and willingly, that's the hard part. That's the, that's the poison pill for me to swallow. I know we are harbingers of, of great news. <laughs> we're, so, we're so happy to be here with you all. <laughs> so where's the hope, I guess, is an important question. Right here in this room. Yeah. This is the hope right here. You're looking at it. I always say, there is, nobody's coming at this point. I've been waiting. Nobody's coming. We are the hope we have been waiting for, you know? So that's how I see it. And, but I think the question for so many people, once you start to educate yourself, is, my God, what can I do? Mm. It's so pervasive and overwhelming. So what do I, we do? We humble citizens have been demonstrating and et cetera, et cetera, mm. for many years. What's your thoughts? Well, looking at our consumption, we have to understand that our standard of living comes at the other end of the gun, facing everyone else in the world. So we try to live voluntary poverty. We try to live simply. We try to consume less. You know, and that may seem like a token effort, but it, it matters. And the more of us who can stop consuming so much, the better off we'll all be. And you know, for myself, the hope is in maintaining hope. We're called to maintain faith, hope, and love. And what are the alternatives? The alternatives are to um, despair, to do nothing. And for myself personally, I can't, I can't do that. I'm not that kind of personality. And, you know, I have disillusions with the Democratic Party, um, with uh, the electoral process. Dorothy never voted. My grandfather voted once for Eugene Debs. That's a good vote. So, That's a good vote. <laughs> you know, so, uh, yeah, I think I think ultimately educating people. Mm -hmm. That's my response. I mean, that it's 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 funny that when you look at that, that's actually even more dangerous. Don't know how many jobs I've lost once I begin opening my <laughs> mouth and start talking about sensitive subjects. People who aren't willing become very defensive and antagonistic towards differing views. I'll sit down. I mean, I live in rural Vermont. I have a farm. Half my neighbors are Trump supporters. The other half are, you know, crystal clutchers, who I love dearly. But they're also in that camp. I'll bring them all together. I'll bring them all together. When our town was split about COVID, vaccines, no vaccines, big pharma, this, that, 5G, I still sit down with everybody. Why? Everybody deserves to be heard, at least. You know, I'm not talking about outright neo-Nazis who are saying, you know, death to everybody. They don't deserve to be heard. But these people are not saying that. These people, maybe my neighbor says, I don't want to get the vaccine. I don't believe in it, this and that. Come talk. Let's have a conversation. Let me tell you my perspective. Let's talk to, actually, more often than not, you get people who can agree with you on a lot of issues. And I'll never forget this. I had a, I had a neighbor who uh, 
a lifelong Republican, tell me after the election, I voted for you. He said, you voted for me? He said, I voted for you. And this guy, Korean war vet, he said, I voted for you. Why? Because I see your ass working all the time on the farm. I see who you are as a person. And that's what we do. We model our lives that way. Mm. So if I'm in the community, even though I'm a scholar, I'm not always cloistered in the house, you know, pouring through all of my dead friends that I communicate with, you know, and their theories. <laughs> it's, about, it's about living. It's about being out there. It's about putting theory into practice. And whether that's done in the arts, like Bertolt Brecht and so many others have talked about the importance of that, which I think is very important. I do it as an educator, as a teacher, as a teacher in a public high school where students deserve to have a good quality education and deserve at least to have some of that uh, propaganda, a little bit of breaking apart in there. Even just a tiny little hole will help them to slowly unravel. And I always tell them, many of the things you've been told are a lie. But that's okay. No need to have an existential crisis and anxiety. And <laughs> next thing you know, I can't come to class, Mr. Halali. That's it. I'm done. No, no. Let's build it up again from the ground up. Let's build new perspectives and things. And of course, Martha and I are always willing to be out at the forefront, putting our bodies out there. Uh, not everybody is capable of traveling abroad. Not everybody can do that. But here in Vermont, for example, uh, I'm a member of Vermonters for Justice in Palestine. Vermonters in Justice in Palestine had a 10 plus year campaign against Ben and Jerry's. And last year we saw the fruits of organizing the fruits of the labor of so many activists here, like Wafik, uh, Mark Hage, uh, so many others um, that were out there doing this work. And what ended up happening? Unilever and Ben & Jerry's are now in a war because the Ben & Jerry's Independent Board said, we are no longer selling our ice cream into occupied territories. And actually what that means, not in Israel at all. The first major company to do that. Those are the small victories mm. that take many years of dedication and endless meetings. <laughs> <laughs> Who's taking the minutes? <laughs> Can you read the minutes from last time? Let's follow the rules of order, you know, here. Robert's rules of orders. But you know what? It panned out. And now Ben and & Jerry's and Unilever are in federal court mm. duking it out, right, and fighting. And it was just released in the Vermont Digger that the judge has cited. But I'm sure it's going to go to appeal uh, with Unilever. I'm sure it's going to go to appeal. I'm sure this war is not going to end in terms of between the companies themselves. What I'm trying to say is that even here in rural Vermont, you can do huge things that, that make mm -hmm. international seismic shifts. And how we do that is different for everybody. But the thing is to remain involved, to be active. I have friends who I went to school with who are now sort of like anarcho-primitivists. I'm going to leave. I'm going into the woods. OK. You want to leave this world? Go into the woods. But guess what? Climate change is still going to find you. <laughs> Nuclear winter is still going to find you. So even though you might think that you can somehow escape, the escape isn't really an escape. The escape is only an escape for yourself in your mind mm. to get out of. But we are all living in it. The question of how you balance that, how you do that, is up to the individual. They have families. They have commitments. But to stay involved to help be involved in the community, and to always be open to other perspectives, even if you don't agree, especially here, to be open to them. And because building those personal relationships change people's ideologies over time. When they see that consistency, I'm not a missionary. So I'm not coming here with the good book, you know, Capitals, Volume 1, 2, and 3 for you all. No, of course not. I, I live where I live. I have roots there. I'm involved member of different committees and, and uh, the his town historical society. So just being involved in that way, you have conversations with people over time, it can change them. And that, I think, is important. Whether you want to die on and be martyred for the cause, whether you want to go to prison, whether you want to do art, whether you want to teach, whether, whatever, le write letters to prisoners, whatever you want to do, everything has a place in the movement. Everything has uh, a part in building a better world. So I'm not going to say one is better. All of them are necessary. All of them. We have a poster in Greece. Uh, the women who were knitting the socks for the guerrillas and the partisans were more important than the partisans because they were the ones who were helping to support them. If it wasn't for the grandmas, my yayas, who were out there knitting and secretly communicating and passing along letters from the boys who would come down about Nazi positions, we would have lost. They did it.
They didn't, they'd never gotten, they didn't get any medals for it. Nobody recognizes them. And they still are in the village with their little headscarf there, like my grandmother's sister now, like in her 90s, still there. But they're the real heroes. They deserve medals like this for what they did. That's what I'm saying. Sometimes they're unsung heroes, but they are the real heroes. And so are all of you in many ways and in many aspects. The thing is to stay involved, ultimately. The grandma right here. <laughs> Any, any last questions or? Thank you so much. Mm, thank, thank you. you. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Chris. Thank you. Absolutely. So good. What a teacher. A real pleasure, as always. What a teacher.